So this morning, our passage came from John chapter 18, and, and this is probably going to be the last uh, lesson presented from this particular chapter. We're going to move on, but I felt like it was worthy and necessary to address especially what is said in verse 37. Uh, we've been studying this, and, and so we get to this point, and this is really a very... Uh, edgy point of the story, is it not? When Jesus has been arrested, he's standing before Pilate. Pilate asks him the question, Art thou then a king? And what happens? Well, Jesus answers him. He says, Thou sayest that I am a king. Now, in my readings and studies, uh, according to what is said here, this is an affirmation where Jesus is pretty much saying that yes I am who you say or who you say that I am okay and and sometimes I think that we don't necessarily recognize that but it's my understanding from the Greek that he's actually giving an affirmation of the fact that he is the king now I have some other passages uh, from prophecy that helps us to further uh, grasp the idea here. Uh, in your Bibles, if you go over to Isaiah chapter 9 and read along with me for just a moment, remember Isaiah was a prophet who was prophesying to uh, the, the pretty much the southern kingdom. And one of the things that he says there in chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, is this. I think we're familiar with this, these words. It says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's, we're pretty familiar with those things. And, and as Isaiah is prophesying, there's one coming forth who's going to, to be this to the people. Uh, and certainly, as we take a look there, that he is the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, there's a lot of of uh, adjectives that define who this individual is going to be, the characteristics, I might say, of this individual. Now notice verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. So it's an everlasting idea. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And we understand that there's this, this individual who portrays these characteristics is not only a prince of peace but is in a position of being king and having dominion over his kingdom. It says further, and to establish, um, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So this was something that was forthcoming. It was uh, prophesied by Isaiah. Now, when did we see this come to fruition? Well, we see it in the life and times of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's a very important principle. You know, in the last week we talked about the fact that the kingdom is the church. Christ is the head of the church. We, we spend a lot of time talking about those things. The week before that, which we'll make some more mention of here in a moment, is when Pilate asked, what is truth? And we talked about that, the truth being God's word, right? And, uh, and the message that Jesus was portraying or, or declaring while he was here. Uh, take, for instance, another passage that we read. This is from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 and verse 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Again, the idea, listen, if there's going to be a kingdom, there's got to be a king. And we recognize the kingdom is the church and our king is the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, uh, was it not written, the king of kings and the Lord of lords? And then uh, in Daniel, you might make reference to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. And again, when we think about all these characteristics and things that are being said by the prophets of old, and again, the writings of old were writ are written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. 
And it substantiates what we believe in today. Take a look at John chapter 1 and verse 49 when Jesus was uh, at the very beginning of his ministry and he falls upon one named Nathanael. Even Nathanael in this early part of his ministry answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God and thou art the King of Israel. And so as, he, as we have these passages uh, that help Further, our understanding, when we take a look at what John chapter 18 says, uh, when Pilate asks that question, are you a king? And uh, furthermore, I think from what we read there in verse 18, uh, it, it's as if Jesus is, is saying, well, rightly so. This is my purpose. And we take a look at the characteristics of what kind of kingdom it was going to be. From these passages, as we mentioned before, his kingdom is not of this world. It's not an earthly kingdom. He's not, he's not, he doesn't have a, uh, a citizenship. How many here today have a dual citizenship? Okay, uh, I, I thought most... Many of you were members of, or citizens of this country and citizens of the Lord's kingdom. Is that? Oh, oh well, yeah. See, got you on that one. You see, we have a, a dual citizenship, if you will, because as members of the Lord's body, as being part of His church, we're in His kingdom, right? And when we were baptized, we were added to the Lord's church, His kingdom. So, so in that sense, we really do have a dual citizenship. But what's interesting about the Lord's kingdom, as we really didn't make too much mention of before, but I think that's what we need to understand here when Jesus is saying to this end or this purpose, as the ESV says, to this purpose was I born and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Well, when we think about this and what we've already uh, studied, what we, I made mention of it last week, Jesus' kingdom is not being part of this earth, so he's not, he's not acquiring weapons, uh, physical weapons. It's not a physical kingdom. You know, there's not a physical wall. Uh, there's not a, a castle somewhere. There's not uh, anything physical or material about his kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. But I ask you, and I think this is a very, very rare question and, and perhaps an interesting one. Who else ever has established or even tried to establish a spiritual kingdom? Satan. Now, I didn't think about that. But for righteousness. Well, there is no man. Right? Because when, we, when, we, when mankind wants to build a kingdom, he wants a castle with a moat around it. You know, and he wants a, a three-bedroom, two-bath <laughs> castle. I don't know. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we sort of, we don't have a, a well, let's just take the United States. There's, there's a military. There's borders around this country. Uh, there is somebody who's in charge. There is a hierarchy. There's all kinds of things that make this a place in which most of us have citizenship here. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's very understandable in the minds of men to understand a kingdom like that. That's why I don't think Pilate, he didn't get it. He didn't grasp it. But that is what Jesus is attempting to portray and he's establishing a spiritual kingdom of which none other has ever done before. But this is a very important kingdom and I want to make mention of a couple of things. First of all, in Ephesians chapter 6, I, made, I know we've made mention of this before, but as Paul, writing to the Ephesians, says in verse 10, uh, Be strong in the Lord, put on the whole armor of God, verse 11, uh, verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, which is what a physical kingdom would do, but rather, or in contrast, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now the interesting thing about this particular kingdom is not only uh, our, our, as, our, as citizens and being part of that spiritual army that we're resisting uh, Satan and all the wiles of the devil. But his kingdom is open to everybody. Right? 
You know, even in, in the United States, there's a lot of people flowing in. They want to flow into the... There are many who want to become members of the United States. But even in that aspect, you know, there's, there's limits with what we can do there, right? And, and we recognize that. But with Jesus in a spiritual kingdom, there is no limit. It's open to everybody. Now, of course, everybody's not going to, to desire to be a citizen of His kingdom. But that's what's so special about this. So when he's talking about, uh, you're saying to, that I'm a king for this purpose I was born. So let's talk a little bit about his purpose then, the mission that he has. I have several passages that I invite you to, to uh, turn to with me. For example, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Jesus says, think not that I am come to the, uh, that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come... To uh, not to destroy, but to fulfill, right? And of course, in retrospect, we understand that he came to fulfill the Old Testament law and all the prophecies, and to establish, of course, a spiritual kingdom. Turn over to Matthew chapter twenty. Matthew chapter twenty is going to be several pages over, and take a look at verse twenty-eight. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Now that doesn't even make sense in, in a, a material sense, in a physical sense. How many kings say, well, I, I came here to give myself up? No way, man. I'm going to sit upon the throne and I'm going to dictate what I want. But not in the spiritual kingdom. That's what makes this so special. The king came to die as a ransom for those who wish to partake in His redemptive blood. It's, it's some very special. Take a look at Luke chapter 19 for just a moment. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, what's so unique about this kingdom and this king? The kingdom is, is spiritual in nature. We have a king, but this king was, gave his life as a ransom for everybody so that everyone can flow into the spiritual kingdom. He was seeking those who were lost. How many kingdoms are set up on that premise? How many? I can't think of one. And of course we're talking about the spiritually lost. One other passage with regard to what his purpose and his mission was. We go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. Notice there the scripture says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Jesus or Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Again, what kingdom has ever been put forth or set up with the intent of strictly saving the spiritual mindset of mankind? None. I can't think of any. None. That's what makes it so unique, so special. And the fact, you know, we made mention of last week that it was in the mind of God before the foundations of the earth. His eternal kingdom, the church. It's really fascinating and fantastic. And, and that's the confession I believe that Jesus is trying to portray here. This is the cause, this is the purpose, this is why I was born and came into this world to set up this unique and special kingdom of which I... And that's not out of an arrogant statement. I'm going to give myself as a life, as a ransom for many. Very special, very unique purpose. It, it's a kingdom like no other. Ever. We think about what he says here, that he should bear witness of the truth. Well, you know, there's, there's two ways to bear witness. And, and I, not too long ago, I had a sermon titled, Another Witness. And we talked about in John chapter 5, verses... Uh, 31 through 47, about all of those witnesses, right, that he had, uh, the, the writings of Moses and the, the works that he did and the signs and the wonders, the miracles that he did. And so these all serve as a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in John chapter 18, verses 19 through 24, 
He has a new witness. And that was the people, the disciples who were, who were following Him and, and doing what He has commanded and asked to do. Of which we are a part today. We continue to be a witness in that sense for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to get, get you confused about what uh, other religious groups say about what witnessing is. Because a lot of that, a lot of the, the, the thought behind that is simply giving a confession or a verbal statement. They talk a lot with their lips. But the word's not in their heart. They say it, but they don't do it. And if there ever was one who did both, that was Jesus. And that's why I, this, in this verse, when he says, I came to bear witness to the truth, it wasn't just that he was speaking words of truth, but he lived it. Did he not give his life as a ransom? Was he not here for the purpose of seeking and saving the lost? And you know, I want to make sure that we understand the idea that spiritually lost, those who are outside of, of God and his kingdom, that was his purpose. In fact, even in his final last will and testament, we talked about that last week, right? That he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Man, it's fascinating how unique and wonderful uh, this whole kingdom, uh, his purpose, and the fact that he was making these statements and living a life uh, of witnessing, if you will, of who he was and what his purpose was. Now, uh, some other passages with regard to being a witness. Let's go back to the prophets again. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 4. There the scripture says, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people, uh, prophesying about Christ and the anointed one. Uh, we also make mention of other passages like we have in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8 and verse 14 there, uh, let me get to that passage. Our Lord says this, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You might make reference of some other passages I have written down here like 1 Timothy 6 and verse 13. I do want to go over to the book of Revelation. Uh, book of Revelation, read one verse there, Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. There it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the, of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. There again, making mention of the fact that he is a faithful witness. So we recognize the affirmation that he was a king. We recognize that there was a purpose or mission that he has stated, a very unique one, one that no, no other man ever has pursued. We know that his witness is true. Not only did he speak the things, but he lived them as well. And of course, we had that message about the truth and what the truth is. But there are a few verses I want to share with you uh, to remind us. For example, John chapter 1 and verse 14. Uh, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, that being the Christ, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 14 and verse 6 where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He spoke it and he lived it. <laughs> what, a, what a concept. And I tell you what, if all of the world leaders would simply do what they say, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? We would know that their word is true. But there again, that's the material world for us. And we're taking a look at the one true Son of God, the very unique individual who was the Christ. And then finally, I have another passage, uh, set of passages I want to make mention of. And this is especially relating to the idea of, of the second part of that verse. Let me get back over there in John chapter 18. When he says, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Now the idea of hearing is not simply the, the scientific process 
uh, when sound waves go and they hit the eardrums and they vibrate and sends a message to the brain. Uh, as fascinating as that is, that's not what this word means. Rather, it means the idea of listening, consuming, taking in the very things that are being said. Understanding, knowledge, comprehension. Uh, what I make mention of, or, or with this, I make mention of several verses. For example, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23, there it says, But he that received seed from the good ground is he that heareth the word, comprehends it, and then acts upon it, and understandeth it, as it says here, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now, the idea is that we are uh, listeners, we understand it, we react to it, we obey it in the sense of obeying the gospel, and then not only then we're committed to continue to build or spread the borders of the kingdom, which is the idea of the bearing of the fruit. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. And then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. They were listening, and they responded to what the command was. Remember? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And uh, is that not still the same gospel message today that we go out and we teach? Are we not to be the witnesses of Jesus in the same sense that we understand His purpose? That we buy into His purpose? We commit to His purpose? That we live lives? Not only do we say the things we ought to say, but our word is our oath and we live those things? Consider uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Remember those uh, Bereans that were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they had received the word with all readiness of mind and then they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. They were connected. They were engaged. I, I, I like the word that Tommy used uh, in the prayer when he talked about being eager. The idea of zeal. Are we eager to serve the Lord? Are we eager to, to live a life of righteousness? Are we connected and engaged in that way? I certainly would hope so. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 says this. Uh, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard from us or of us, you received it not as the word of men... But as it is in truth, the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. God's Word is effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. And so with all of these things in mind that our Lord affirmed the fact that He is the King of, of this very unique uh, kingdom. That there's been none like it and there never will be another one like it. And here we are as citizens of that kingdom to enjoy this special arrangement, this uniqueness. You know, it really surprises me that people in the world are, are striving to find their own uniqueness. They want to be different and unique. And yet, they don't even consider this. And how special this is to be a member of the Lord's body. There was a mission, a purpose for Him. Uh, he said the truth. He uh, lived the truth. <clears throat> The truth being the Word of God, the things that He promoted, and then we as receivers or receptors of the truth, we must not only hear the Word of God, but then act upon it so that we can continue to spread the borders of the kingdom. As I close, I just close with asking a question. In that particular passage in John chapter 18, I gotta get back over there because my my brain. I know if I I'll stumble if I try to do it from my memory. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. What are you hearing? Well, we're hearing a beautiful baby crying, <laughs> but that's okay. But I think what we need to do is understand it in the, in the context that we've been talking about this morning, in a spiritual context. Now, it's interesting to me, I don't think our younger people, people understand uh, the idea of, you remember on the old 
radios. Boy, I'm really dating myself. And the old car radios and the uh, if for some reason it got off of the station, it was, it was a lot of static. And you had to take the dial and, and tune it in. And, and you, it was uh, analog, so you kind of would have to go a little bit to one side, back over there, till you just got it just right. I think sometimes that's what our spiritual lives are. Sometimes we're, we're out of tune. You know, especially those who are not members of the Lord's body. I, your radio is not even on. And we want to invite you to turn your radio on in that sense that you are uh, buried with Him in the waters of baptism as He commanded to repent and be baptized. Acts 2.38, Romans 6, and so forth. But for those of us who already are Christians, we're already citizens of the kingdom, sometimes we're out of tune. And we need to refocus. We need to refocus and get tuned in to what the truth is of what our Lord is and the, the obligation, the responsibility that we have as a witness to Him in that we speak the truth and we live the truth. And that there is an eagerness behind that for us. Because don't you want to go to heaven? Aren't you eager about that? Isn't there an excitement and zeal that's behind that? Amen. And so I just want to encourage you to think about that as we all examine ourselves, spiritually speaking, and being citizens of a very unique and special kingdom. If there is any way that we can assist you today, whether it's through prayers for encouragement, prayers for forgiveness, or if there's somebody who's ready to obey the gospel, we invite you to come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Thank <laughs> you.